Welcome to everyone, uh, and thank you for joining us today. Uh, my name is Gerald Newman, and I'm the director of the Human Rights Program here at Harvard Law School. Uh, it is our great pleasure uh, to be able to present to you uh, today, Professor Eva Brems, uh, who will be speaking on the subject, Hidden Under Headscarves, Women and Religion in the Case Law of the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, professor Brems is a professor of human rights law and head of the Human Rights Center at Ghent University in Belgium. Uh, she's the author of numerous books and articles and leader of many innovative collaborative research projects. Uh, she's also the chair of Belgium's National Human Rights Institution, uh, the Federal Institute for the Promotion and Protection uh, of Human Rights. Uh, she will be uh, presenting uh, her talk on this subject uh, and then uh, we'll turn to a question and answer period, uh, which I will open, uh, but uh, we invite the audience to submit questions uh, for Professor Brems, uh, and please use the Q&A function uh, at the bottom of your Zoom screen uh, to present questions, and I will try to ask as many of them uh, as I can. Uh, I'd like to thank the co-sponsors of the event, uh, the HLS program on law and society in the Muslim world, the Harvard Women's Law Association, the Harvard Muslim Law Students Association, uh, and the Harvard Law Advocates uh, for Human Rights. Uh, without more ado, then uh, let me turn the word to Professor Brems. Thank you very much. I'll uh, share my screen for a PowerPoint. I hope uh, you're seeing that now. So I would like to start with uh, situating today's presentation in the context of my broader work. Uh, and there you get it now, the PowerPoint is not moving. Dear. So we actually tried this and it was moving at that point. Let me try this again. I'm not doing this anymore. I'll use the other function then, uh, where you see also the size of the PowerPoints. Yeah. Um, so, um, I see myself as a researcher, as a generalist in the field of uh, human rights law. So, in a conception, a European conception of that field, really, that embraces national as well as European and uh, UN levels. And this topic uh engages with several of the fields in which i have been more active than others uh in particular the european convention on human rights women's rights and law and religion in particular the rights of muslim minorities in europe so i've written a lot about islamic dress restrictions from a human rights perspective and this is this started because Belgium, the country I'm based in, has a lot of those restrictions. So I did my first paper on this in 2004, that were headscarf bans in schools, later headscarf bans in other places, face veil bans, and most recently, burkini bans. I really don't seem able to get rid of the topic because of the legal uh, developments in my home country. Now, in my work, I have often used this topic as a lens or a case study to address a broader issue in human rights law. One of those is human rights fragmentation, because UN bodies have taken a very different approach to this issue compared to the European Court of Human Rights. Another is procedural fairness, so the concept that people's perceptions of justice are determined more by process than by outcomes. And in my most recent work in this field, intersectionality, so the phenomenon of multiple grounds of oppression interacting to create a new situation of oppression that cannot simply be reduced to the sum of its part. So what I want to present today is an analysis 
of the case law of the European Court of Human Rights regarding women and religion. And as we are in the United States, I'm not assuming familiarity with the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, I mean, first, I need to say this, I need to say this even in Belgium, the European Court of Human Rights is not a body of the European Union. The European Union also has a court, the Court of Justice of the EU based in Luxembourg. It actually also has a few head to carve cases, but I'm not talking about those today. So the European Court of Human Rights is based in Strasbourg, France. It's a body that supervises the European Convention on Human Rights, a treaty concluded in the context of the Council of Europe, which is an international order organization that counts 46 member states. Actually, it's the first uh, time I named that number. It used to be 47 until very recently when Russia was still a member. Um, 47 as compared to 27 for the e, uh, 46 <laughs> as compared to 27 for the uh, EU, that means that the Council of Europe includes, for example, Ukraine uh, or Turkey. Uh, European Court of Human Rights deals with complaints against states, mostly complaints from individuals. Complaints are admissible after exhaustion of domestic re uh, remedies. Now, in reality, the domestic effect of the convention is, of course, key. Yeah? In many states, this convention has direct effect in national law. <clears throat> For instance, in Belgium, the fundamental rights in the Constitution are always read together with the European Convention uh, on Human Rights. Now, when I was a law student studying human rights law in the year 1990, the court was still young and we simply studied all of its judgments, all of them. Today, the accumulated case law counts several hundreds of thousands of rulings. In 2021 alone, the court issued final rulings in over 36,000 cases, including over 3,000 judgments on the merits. The rest are decisions on, uh, in it, of inadmissibility. Many of those are repetitive or clear cases, yet quite a few give rise to a lot of debate. And some of the most controversial rulings of the European Court of Human Rights concern women religious freedom. In particular, academics as well as human rights groups have widely criticized the court's acceptance of restrictions on Muslim women's dress. And a lot of this critique concerns the court's perceived abandoning of religious minorities who are confronted with intolerance. Yet from the start, part of this critique has also adopted a gender perspective. Prominent in this line of scholarship is Carolyn Evans, who, commenting on two early headscarf cases, pointed out how these judgments reflect two contradictory stereotypes of Muslim women that prevail in popular political culture. The first stereotype I'm quoting uh, is that of victim, the victim of gender oppressive religion needing protection from abusive, violent male relatives and passive, unable to help herself in the face of a culture of male dominance. The second stereotype relied on by the court is that of aggressor, the Muslim woman as a fundamentalist who forces values onto the unwilling and undefended, end of quote. She wrote this in 2006. 15 years later, there's a lot more case law. And what I decided to do is to look beyond the headscarf and study a corpus of case law at the intersection of women's rights and religious freedom. So the objectives of this study were double. I wanted to move beyond the debate about the disappointing outcomes of many of these cases and get a more sophisticated understanding of the reasoning that leads to those outcomes through the lens of intersectionality. And at the same time, this study is also an exploration of intersectionality analysis as an instrument in human rights scholarship. In that sense, it can also uh, be read as a case study. For the purpose of this analysis, a case law corpus has been composed that consists of 14 judgments and decisions issued since 2001, 2001 being uh, an important moment of renewal of the European Court of Human Rights after the entry into force of the 11th protocol to the convention and the installation of the court as a permanent uh, court.
So this corpus of 14 was distilled from a broader one of 24 that includes all the rulings raising both women's uh, gender interests and uh, religion interests by reducing clusters of similar cases, so cases with parallel reasoning by the court to a single representative case. The study relies on systematic close reading of that smaller corpus against the background of the broader one. And for the presentation today, I will select some examples. Now, in, in all but three cases of the corpus, the religion involved is Islam, not the majority religion in Europe, obviously, except for three cases against Turkey, this is in a context in which Islam is a minority religion. So the three uh, other cases concern Christians in countries where Christian, Christianity is a majority religion, but in all those cases, the applicants interpret and practice their religion in a manner that is significantly stricter uh, than that of the majority of believers in their country. Now, this corpus is dominated by two thematic clusters plus a few miscellaneous cases. My examples today will draw from those two uh, main clusters. The first thematic cluster consists of eight judgments, but really nine cases, uh, concerning women who allege violations of religious freedom because they were not allowed to wear religious dress or symbols. In seven of these cases, the women lost in Strasbourg. These are cases worn uh, about headscarves worn by a primary school teacher, the Dalap case, by students in high school, the Dogru case, or students at university, the Leila Shahin case, uh, an employee of a public hospital as well, that's the Ibrahimian case. There was also a case about the removal of a headscarf for a security check at the consulate, the El Morsley case, and a ban on face covering in the entire public space, the SAS case. Eweida versus UK is an exceptional case in its format as it combines four different claims concerning religious accommodation in the workplace. The corpus, corpus includes uh, two of those. Uh, Ms. Eweida and Ms. Chaplin's cases both complained about a ban on wearing a Christian cross around the neck at work. In the case of uh, Ms. Eweida, an air hostess, the, the court found a violation of religious freedom, whereas in the case of Ms. Chaplin, a nurse, it found no violation. The difference in outcome was explained by the fact that reasons for the ban in Chaplin, so the nurse, were based on health and safety concerns, which weighed more heavily in the balance, in the proportionality analysis, uh, than the corporate image concerns that were invoked in the case of the airline. The one other case that was won by the applicant, Lahiri v. Belgium, concerned a ban on headgear in a courtroom as applied to a headscarf worn by a civil party in criminal proceedings. Um, a second cluster of three cases concerns the place of Islamic law in a context of legal pluralism. That is to say, scenarios involving a degree of actual or potential state recognition of Islamic law. In Refa Partisi v. Turkey, the court finds the dissolution of a political party to be justified for several reasons, one of which concerns the party's announcement that it would install a system of legal pluralism, including Islamic law. And one of the reasons for which Islamic law is considered problematic in this case regards its rules on the legal status of women. On the other hand, in the case of uh, the case of Sherife Yigit uh, v. Turkey, concerns the consequences of the lack of state recognition of Islamic law when it is nevertheless being privately applied in practice. So in this case, the applicant was a widow who had been married only under religious law, not civil law. And as a result, she was not entitled to a survivor's pension and social security benefits based on her deceased partner's entitlement. She argued that this was a discrimination, but she lost her case. A key argument in the court's reasoning was that civil Civil marriage was there to protect women. And finally, Mola Sali versus Greece concerns a rare case of state-sanctioned application of Islamic law in Europe in the context of the Muslim minority in Western Thrace, which is a region in Greece bordering on Turkey. 
On the basis of a 1923 treaty between Greece and Turkey, Mufti jurisdictions apply Islamic law in that part of Greece. Under the interpretation of Greek courts, the application of Islamic law, specifically in the case of inheritance, is a mandatory for all Muslims in Western Thrace. This was contested by the applicant, whose share of the inheritance was significantly smaller under Islamic law than it would have been under Greek civil law. She won her case. The court held that this mandatory application of Islamic law was a discrimination on the ground of religion. Now, the configuration of the gender equality dimension and the religious freedom dimension in these cases takes two distinct shapes. The first one is a combination of the gender interest and the religion interest in the person of the applicant. This is the case when a female applicant claims the right to practice religion in a gendered manner. For example, the right to wear religious dress worn typically by women. The second one is a scenario in which a gender interest is invoked by the state as an argument against granting a religious claim. The state in this scenario argues that a religious practice is detrimental to gender equality. Now, both configurations can coexist in a single case. If we focus on, on the two clusters I mentioned, the gender argument against religion is present in all but one of the cases in the corpus. Uh, the exception being a way that the UK, because objections against wearing a Christian cross do not include arguments of gender equality, as opposed to objections against wearing a headscarf or face veil. At the same time, the gender argument in combination with religion characterizes the headscarf and face veil cases, but is absent from the other cases, so the Christian cross case and the legal pluralism cases. This typology can be the basis for a further question, which is whether all cases in the corpus raise intersectionality issues. The answer is yes for the cases in the two clusters. In the context of this study, intersectionality issues arise when the gender interest and the religion interests relate, at least in part, to the same women. This includes all cases in which women claim the right to gender-specific religious practice, so the religious dress and symbol cases, because a headscarf and face veil are worn only by women. And a cross around the neck is also overwhelmingly worn by women. In addition, the legal pluralism cases also raise intersectionality issues. Uh, in Sherif Egigi, this concerns the applicant herself, who as a religious woman wants her religious marriage to have legal consequences. In Mola Sali and Refa Partisi, intersectionality is at stake to the extent that the case uh, discusses the potential application of religious rules to women among the Muslim population at large. So all of the cases are intersectionality salient. Focusing on that intersection, I have examined the cases in the corpus in light of a few benchmarks of what I consider to be good intersectionality practice in human rights law. In the first place, it is self-evident that intersectionality-sensitive judicial reasoning requires that attention is paid to the different relevant identity layers that may have contributed to the alleged human rights violation. In the context of this study, this means that it's necessary to work with the fact that the applicants or other stakeholders in the case are believers, and in many cases that they adhere to a minority religion. And it means that it's also necessary to identify them as women and to name, in addition to their religious interest in the case, also their gendered interest. Next, I think that an effective approach to intersectionality analysis can be one that starts with the deconstruction of harmful intersectional stereotypes. In the context of this study, this would include, for example, the stereotypes about Muslim women, including the stereotypes of the submissive victim and the fundamentalist aggressor. Deconstructing means that the stereotypes, as well as the harm they do, need to be explicitly named. On a more basic and preliminary level, a precondition for a workable intersectionality approach is that the European Court of Human Rights should avoid 
directly or indirectly confirming such intersectional stereotypes in its own reasoning. Third, in my view, a human rights approach to intersectionality points towards the insider per perspectives and lived experiences of the individuals concerned. This means that it would be very difficult to achieve good intersectionality practice through a purely abstract approach. Instead, concrete intersectional individuals should take center stage in the reasoning. So what are my findings under each of these three angles? Looking at the first benchmark, a manifest finding from the case law analysis is the gender blindness of the court in cases of applicants claiming the right to gender specific religious practice. Manifestly, at least in my view, when a state bans a religious activity that's only practiced by women, the claim for gender discrimination is as strong as that of religious discrimination. What happens before the European Court of Human Rights, however, is that the impact on religious practice is the focus of the discussion, whereas the impact on women is ignored. In the first cases of this kind, the applicants submitted to the court arguments of gender discrimination in addition to violations of religious freedom. This was rejected by the court with the argument that the ban was not directed at those persons because they were women, because the court referred to the aim of the measure rather than the impact of the measure, the disproportionate impact on women was made irrelevant. In later cases, the applicants did not claim gender discrimination, despite the fact that the court had in the meantime introduced the concept of indirect discrimination in its reasoning. Although the court could have introduced uh, the gender discrimination argument on its own initiative in any of these cases, it's fair to conclude that the applicants and their legal advisors share with the court the responsibility for this remarkable gender blindness. In SAS, the face veil case, however, the court recognized that the applicant could claim indirect discrimination in that, I quote, as a Muslim woman who for religious reasons wishes to wear the full face veil in public, she belongs to a category of individuals who are particularly exposed to the banning question and to the sanctions for which it provides, end of quote. However, the court ultimately dismissed the claim. And while the reasoning building on the intersectional reference person of the Muslim woman who uh, seems an important step, there has been no follow up to this. It can thus be concluded that the court, partly as a result of framing by the applicants, has in several cases had a blind spot for the gendered interests that were at stake. Next, in the search for good intersectionality practice, comes the court's engagement with harmful stereotypes. Let's first look whether the court names and deconstructs harmful stereotypes. It's probably superfluous to point out that in the context of policy debate and in wider society, harmful stereotypes abound when issues such as veil bans are discussed. In the case law, however, we find barely any trace of deconstruction of such stereotypes. It has to be acknowledged that in its case law overall, the court so far has limited experience with an anti-stereotyping approach. Moreover, the fact that most religious women saw their claims rejected by the court also explains why the stereotypes about them are not addressed in the judgment. Still, in the SAS face veil judgment, the court stated that, quote, a state which enters into a legislative process of this kind takes the risk of contributing to the consolidation of the stereotypes which affect certain categories of the population and of encouraging the expression of intolerance when it has a duty, on the contrary, to promote tolerance." End of quote. However, this mention does not name, let alone deconstruct, the specific stereotypes at play, nor did it weigh heavily in the balance given that the court did not find a violation. It made us be concluded that while the court has recognized the problem of harmful stereotypes in an important case, it has yet to embark upon naming and contesting harmful stereotypes in its women and religion case law. 
The second wing of the anti-stereotyping analysis scrutinizes the court's own discourse to find out if it refrains from confirming harmful stereotypes that prevail in political and societal discourse. From this angle, a number of troubling patterns can be noted. The first one is about women in need of protection. In none of the cases in the corpus that invoke gender equality in combination with religious freedom, was gender equality a winning argument? This stands in contrast to the finding that in all the cases in the corpus in which a gender argument was made against religious freedom, this was a winning argument. Now, three types of arguments um, regarding threats to gender equality can be identified in these cases. The argument that the religious practice threatens the gender equality of the applicants themselves, uh, that argument was rejected by the court in SAS, the face veil case. And it is not explicitly found in any of the other cases in the corpus. Direct paternalism claiming that individually identified adult women have to be protected against their own choices is thus not found in the corpus. The winning gender equality arguments concern either gender equality in the abstract, that's to say the rights of women in general, we find that in the legal pluralism cases, or the perception that a religious practice or its accommodation sends a message against gender equality, so symbolic gender equality, really. That is identified in many of the headscarf cases as well as uh, the Faceville case. Summing up, we see that a gender equality argument brought against a religion-based claim is a winner overall in the case law corpus, confirming thus the view of religion as a threat to women. The court contributes to an image of women as being in need of protection. Because of women's rights, we need to get rid um, of these religious practices. A closely related finding from this case law corpus is the court's willingness to embrace arguments of freedom from religion as opposed to freedom of religion arguments regarding women. Mola Sali, the Greek case, is the only case in which a woman herself claims the right to be free from religion, concretely the right not to be subjected to religious law against her will. Yet several other cases can be read as cases involving a right to be free from religion as a winning argument. Uh, for example, uh, in Dalap, uh, the primary school teacher who could not wear a headscarf, the right of pupils to be free from religious expression by their teachers is a decisive argument. And in Leila Shahin, this extends to the rights of university students to be free from religious practice by their fellow students. The court's willingness to embrace freedom from religion arguments as opposed to freedom of religious arguments is revealing regarding a negative attitude to religion or more specifically Islam in combination with an argument that situates the harm from religion in its attitude towards women. And this contributes to an image of Muslim women as helpless victims in need of liberation. And this brings in the related theme of women's autonomy and agency. The representation of women in the case law as in need of protection and liberation obviously works against an image of them as autonomous agents. At the same time, the case law sends mixed signals with regard to religious women's autonomy. In some cases, it seems to ignore it as seemingly beside the point. This is striking in Leila Shahin, where the applicant emphasized the agency of university students against the argument that her headscarf would have a negative influence on them. On the other hand, Sherife Yigit, uh, in that case, the autonomy argument is turned against the applicant, where the court emphasizes that it was her own choice to live in a religious marriage. The one judgment in the case law corpus that strongly and explicitly comes out in favor of the applicant woman's agency and self-determination is Mola Sali, the Greek case, where the claim was won against religion. 
So women uh, can autonomously choose against religion, but can they also autonomously choose in favor of religious practice? Um, summing up, the scrutiny of the case law from the perspective of women's agency and autonomy does not deliver any results that show the court endorsing women's autonomy in support of their right to perform a religious practice. The analysis just shows that the court's case law on women and religion only rarely contradicts prevalent harmful stereotypes about religious women, specifically Muslim women. In addition, its discourse and reasoning strengthens perceptions of these women as submissive, lacking autonomy and in need of protection. At the same time, it seems that this is a collateral effect of a more prominent tendency in the case law, which is the portrayal of religion and Islam in particular as a threat. To the extent that women are portrayed as in need of protection, what they need protecting from is religion. An analysis of the case law corpus from the angle of the reverse stereotype of the religious woman as a fundamentalist aggressor reveals this pattern even more clearly. In the case law concerning the Islamic headscarf, the frequent emphasis on the negative impact of the headscarf on others manifestly contributes to harmful stereotypes of the headscarf wearer as a fundamentalist threat. Upon closer examination, the headscarf wearers themselves are barely present in the court discourse. Instead, their headscarves are personified to embody the threat. This is in particular the case in the reference to the headscarf as a powerful external symbol. Acknowledging the absence of any complaints about the behavior of the wearers, the court accepts the argument that a headscarf ban is necessary as it is the headscarf itself that infringes the rights of others. As long as they wear that scarf, there's nothing those women can do to not be seen as threatening, it seems. There can be little doubt that this case law contributes to harmful stereotypes about religious women as sources of danger. With bad marks on the first two benchmarks, how does the European Court of Human Rights score on the third one, the focus away from abstract gender equality on concrete women and their voices and experiences? Several elements in the stereotyping analysis suggest that the court does not pay much attention to the point of view and the lived experiences of real women at the intersection of the religion interest and the gender interest in a case. As mentioned, across the case law corpus, gender equality overrides religious freedom. As explained, it is abstract gender equality, either referring to the treatment of women in general or to symbolic equality as a message to general society. The priority status of such general conceptions of gender equality holds regardless of the interests and preferences of the real women at the intersection of gender and religion. This is very clear in the legal pluralism cases. In Sherifi Yigit, the applicant was denied the pragmatic solution of recognizing her religious marriage for the purpose of access to social benefits, thus suffering a highly gendered type of injustice, typical for women left alone after devoting themselves mostly to caretaking rather than wage earning activities. Yet in the eyes of the court, it was fair that she should suffer such harm in the name of abstract gender justice. In Mola Sali, the Greek case, the abstract gender equality argument that was invoked in the court's reasoning was largely irrelevant in the circumstances of the case, which opposed two female potential heirs, the deceased widow and his sister. Finally, in Refa Partisi, the discussion relates to the program of a political party to install Islamic law as an option for Muslims. This optionality is quite clear from the sources that are referred to in the judgment, yet it's completely ignored by the court. In my view, this is an oversight that stands in the way of a perspective that favors the agency of women at the intersection. Such a perspective might a priori be favorable to a scenario that gives them the choice to balance their gender interests and their religion interests by deciding whether or not to opt for the application of religious law. As I see it, good intersectionality practice requires engaging with the perspective and experiences of women at the intersection. In this regard, the court's gender and religion case law seems to be 
on a different track. To conclude, uh, the benchmarks I proposed here are not the only way intersectionality practice can be assessed. Nevertheless, it is striking to find such poor performance for each of them. At the root of the problem stands the court's blindness for the gender interests that are embedded in many religion-related claims. Yet poor intersectionality practice is compounded by the court's lack of engagement with harmful stereotypes and its prioritizing abstract gender equality over the needs of concrete women. The court's tendency to portray Islam as a threat also leads to it confirming long-standing and widespread harmful stereotypes about religious women. I happen to know that the European Court of Human Rights has recently organized anti-stereotyping training for its staff. So let's hope that the results of that will become visible in the case law in this field. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Brems, for that very illuminating discussion. Uh, we're moving to the question and answer period now, and I encourage people uh, who have been uh, listening uh, to play a more active role uh, through the Q&A function. Uh, I'll ask a first question uh, while we're waiting for more questions to come in. Intersectionality originated as a concept in discrimination law, uh, and your application of it in the paper and in the talk uh, is primarily to cases that are raising religion claim. Uh, and it's an example of the application of intersectionality outside the sphere of non-discrimination law uh, to what one could call substantive rights that are protected uh, directly rather than through the protection of a non-discrimination norm. Uh, in discrimination law, we analyze uh, comparative treatment as between groups. Uh, and part of the problem that intersectionality responds to uh, is that there's a limited number of groups. Uh, originally, the issue was uh, that black women suffer disadvantages that are not adequately captured by asking what disadvantages do women in general suffer, or by asking what disadvantages do black people in general offer? Um, but with regard to the substantive rights, these are non-comparative impairments uh, and people can raise them as individuals in their own individual uniqueness. Uh, so my question is, why is intersectionality needed or useful uh, in the analysis of these substantive uh, rights claims. Mm. Uh, thank you, Professor Norman. That, that's, that's a really good question. And, and, and I'm happy with, with the opportunity to talk a bit uh, about that. But maybe first I need to say, if we talk about improving, let's say the intersectionality analysis in these cases, it would probably involve adding anti-discrimination analysis. So in, in addition to Article 9 uh, religious of the European Convention, uh, religious freedom, it would probably mean adding an Article 14 plus 9, so anti-discrimination uh, analysis uh, as well. But it is absolutely my point that uh, intersectionality analysis is relevant also beyond anti-discrimination uh, in human rights law. Now, this is of course because intersectionality is a means to address the full injustice, all dimensions of the injustice as experienced by the individual. So that's important to them, to the persons uh, who undergo this. It's it's a, it's a recognition interest, but it's also, in my view, important for the broader approach to the human rights issue. It's, it's a means of 
understanding better what's going on and thus enabling a better prevention, better uh, remedying, and so on. Now, the, the thing um, that fascinates me in, is that human rights law really recognizes the importance of doing justice to the specific ways in which specific categories uh, of people suffer uh, human rights violations. Human rights law does that beyond anti-discrimination in a big way by having special treaties and special uh, soft law instruments uh, aimed at certain categories uh, of people. Uh, uh, women, children, persons with disabilities, uh, etc. So in a way, that's an inherent way of thinking in, in human rights law. It's important to see, the, to recognize the specific types and the specific ways in which uh, certain people become uh, victims of human rights violations. Of course, the very format of, of having special treaties leads to fragmentation and, and could make it, in principle, more difficult to see uh, the crossroads and the intersections. But what we see in reality is that several of the UN treaty bodies monitoring these treaties have actually uh, begun to, to mobilize intersectionality uh, analysis. And, and so th th there is some of that thinking around there that, that could be incorporated, uh, could, could serve as a, as a source of inspiration for, for example, uh, a European Court of Human Rights. Now, now what I think is that anti-discrimination reasoning um, can can sometimes be a straitjacket. Um, it's 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 a more formalized than general proportionality analysis under other uh, substantive human rights provisions. If you if you have to deal with the comparator, uh, it can be really tricky. Who's your comparator in an intersectional case? Um, I think under other human rights, um, there's more room for freestyle uh, reasoning. You can incorporate those those yeah strategies I mentioned, an anti-stereotyping reasoning, uh, an assessment of, of the, the the voices and the experiences and the preferences of concrete uh, women uh, involved. You can bring that in. Uh, in my view, actually, more easily under uh, substantive provisions than under uh, anti-discrimination uh, reasoning. Now, having said that, my, my thoughts on this are, are in a beginning stage. I have currently a PhD researcher working on intersectionality in human rights law. She's going to solve it all. So uh, <laughs> shout out to Sarah Schoenches. Uh, let's uh, watch her work over uh, the next years. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, our first question uh, from the audience uh, asks, how do you think the margin of appreciation doctrine uh, in the recent conservative transitions in Turkey uh, may affect the legitimacy uh, of the European court's judgments, uh, such as Leila Shaheen, uh, where the court decided that the ban on the headscarf was not in violation of the convention. Yeah. Um, this is a, a really good point. Leila Shaheen was, of course, uh, ruled at the, in a different political uh, context. It's a grand chamber judgment, so it stands <laughs> with massive authority and, and is, is uh, difficult to overrule. Uh, many people have questioned the margin of appreciation, doctrine, for those who don't know what is this? This is a doctrine uh, where the European Court of Human Rights actually says we're not going for uniformity. And that's a big difference between the court in Strasbourg uh, and, and the court in Luxembourg of the EU. They go for uniformity. They, they go for, for uh, the same standards everywhere. What the U European Court of Human Rights is does is typical human rights reasoning. You have you establish a bottom line, but but you're not going for for uniformity. So there's a lot of room um, for national legislators, national judges as well, to do their own balancing between the human rights and and the interests that may justify uh, legitimate uh, restriction. And I have a whole doctrine um, with criteria and such. 
Um, so many people criticize this in any case, huh? and, which, and because we typically see a lot of that in religious freedom cases. Uh, and, and I, for one, would be one to say the, the way the court has been using the margin of appreciation has been to the detriment of minorities, uh, giving all this credit uh, to parliamentary majorities without scrutinizing whether they are not uh, operating on the basis of bias, uh, uh, you're not doing your job. Um, but the, the question uh, coming from the audience, it goes a step further and is saying, in the current uh, political context in Turkey, is it still legitimate to grant such a wide margin of appreciation? That's actually a, a, a fascinating uh, question. We see in practice, um, a Turkish scholar, Basak uh, Tali, has, has written an, a, a great paper about this. We see that the intensity of scrutiny uh, applied by the European Court of Human Rights is not necessarily the same in all cases. And, and that the court might actually be stricter and, and, and have a more thorough supranational review in cases where it's implicitly, yeah, without actually saying so, seems to uh, have less confidence in, in uh, the quality of uh, the democratic process uh, at the national level um, or the, the independence uh, of the judiciary coming to uh, a certain conclusion. And this, this is formalized through what we call a kind of procedural review, where the, where the court will say that we we make this wide margin of appreciation conditional uh, upon uh, our finding that the process at the national level uh, complies with certain quality standards. And, and so this is an indirect way of bringing in uh, what, what the person who asked the question called this legitimacy uh, check. Um, personally, I think it is a very good idea to bring in, uh, to, 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 to try and do something with this. Uh, to, I think the court has to up its game in the light of the decline uh, of democracy and rule of law in several Council of Europe member states and has to devise uh, strategies for stricter scrutiny in such cases, in particularly cases that are salient uh, in this democratic decline context. And that includes, for example, uh, minority cases or cases about uh, groups that typically uh, can become um, targets uh, in contexts of, of um, Oh, yeah, uh, 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 democratic decline or, or uh, populism, uh, etc. Um, whether this can be realized in this line of case law is doubtful. I, I don't expect it. I don't expect it because of um, um, yeah the status of the grand chamber uh, judgment and the, and the, and the specific topic. Yeah. I'm not hearing you. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Just to follow up on uh, the last uh, portion of what you were saying, another question asks, uh, given that the existing cases leave much to be desired, uh, what might be a path forward for the European court to uh, reach a more intersectional approach in the future? Um, I'll add either uh, in the specific context that you're talking about or a fuller use of intersectionality more generally. Uh, are there cases in the pipeline that might give the court an opportunity to change course? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think uh, that there are two things. One is um, an awareness. So, so I'm, I'm rather in favor of these supranational human rights actors seeing themselves as part of, of a network uh, of, of uh, human rights law as a, as, as a whole, uh, in a way, and, and um, of a sort of openness 
to, for example, the work of these UN treaty bodies who have started working on intersectionality, on anti-stereotyping, and CEDAW committee has a lot on that, uh, for example. Uh, so a growing awareness of the court of being part of that bigger family, I think it's in their own interest, you know, to sometimes open that umbrella because the court is, is as, as many of these actors under, under attack uh, in, in a negative political uh, climate. So opening your umbrella, seeking that legitimacy from the broader uh, human rights system is also in their own interest. If you get more of that uh, di um, dynamic of, of, of that self perception uh, as part of that bigger family, you could get more borrowing, uh, more inspiration uh, taken from, from uh, developments elsewhere. And what we've seen in particular uh, on, on the religious dress cases, all of the UN treaty bodies, and, and at least five, have had uh, um, to, to address it, take a different approach. Uh, they they criticise uh, bans. Um, another thing, um, a, a different uh, approach is third party interventions and the applicants themselves. So I've tried to be fair towards the court in my analysis, pointing out that the applicants are partly to blame for, for, for the gender blindness. Uh, if your attorney doesn't raise certain issues, um, yeah. What we see in, in a lot of these cases is um, that the court can often picks up such elements such as anti-stereotyping uh, reasoning. It's very clear there, for example, if they are um, if they figure in interventions by third parties, uh, which are typically uh, uh, so amicus curiae, yeah? so that's the term uh, for amicus curiae intervention in the European Court uh, of Human Rights, third party interventions. So we've seen the uh, anti-stereotyping um, reasoning uh, entering for the first time in the Konstantin uh, Markin case, a case against Russia, uh, actually after our own center, uh, Human Rights Center at Ghent University, insisted on that in a third party intervention. Uh, we've seen it come in in SASV France, the face veil case, after the applicants and several of the third party interveners uh, insisted on that uh, in their intervention. So in that sense, we see a lot of activity. There is um, a case uh, of um, another uh, headscarf case uh, pending in which um, at least we, together with our colleagues from uh, Free University of Brussels, have insisted a lot in our interventions uh, on intersectionality. Uh, we're planning, we're preparing with our own legal clinic also a Burkina ban case, which will also be a, a good, a winnable case, I think. Um, in, in which such analysis can be made, because that's sort of a precondition. You need a winnable case. The court is unlikely to engage a lot in uh, the more sophisticated reasoning in favor of the applicant if its ultimate conclusion is going to be there's actually no violation. Um, so we are looking uh, for cases that even in the very disappointing lines of case law that you have could still be won because you could uh, differentiate them uh, from what has already been ruled upon. And for example, swimming pool uh, rules um, could be could be one of one of those things. Thank you. Uh, Another question asks, applying the intersectional approach, do you think that class migrant background uh, also comes into play? Uh, as far as I know, the questioner asks, most headscarf cases from France and Belgium especially concern women of migrant background. Would the gender sensitivity of the European court be yeah. higher uh, if the case is concerned what could be called autochthonous uh, French or Belgian women? Yeah, we, 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 we can speculate about that. Um, one one, one uh, issue is certain, well, it's, it's quite certain that the fact that Islam is seen as not a European uh, religion uh, uh, is, is plays a big part in it being seen as a threat and in these, these negative stereotypes affecting these, these uh, women, uh, etc. Um, one 
thing one can do is uh, bring in migration background or even race, ethnicity in the intersectionality analysis, because that's also what we are often uh, talking about in terms of disparate impact, uh, at least, uh, and in terms of the harmful stereotypes uh, as well. It, it, it all um, hangs uh, together. So there's, a, there's, there's, a, there's, uh, there's certain real a rule for that factor. Um, that's something that can be interesting also sometimes um, for men, because we're used to, uh, it, when we talk about gender stereotypes, now this is beyond this paper, but when we talk about gender stereotypes, a lot of the time we're talking about stereotypes affecting women. But if, if you look about, you, if you look at people with a migration background, there are actually quite a few harmful stereotypes affecting men. I eh? think in the refugee context, uh, the very different treatment single men receive as opposed to women uh, refugees. Um, so, so they incorporate that, that that threat uh, uh, often uh, in the, um, public perception. Um, so yeah, oh, <laughs> I've lost my I've lost the thread uh, um, of my reasoning. I think this is uh, very relevant. And do I think uh, it's all racism? Absolutely. <laughs> I think Islamophobia is a type. Uh, of racism and that it is very much linked to the migration background of people. Uh, you, it's 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 uh, very clear if you if you look at the broader context of Islamophobia in European societies, where it has literally just replaced. Uh, race as a category when it became not done uh, uh, to say we don't like Arabs, it became acceptable to say we don't like Muslims. And, and so it literally one category uh, replaced the other. Um, and, and so it's, it's actually a, a, a really good point uh, to point, uh, uh, yeah. One, someone should do uh, another paper <laughs> integrating uh, that dimension. I wrote this one for a special issue on women and religion. So, so I, uh, yeah, uh, <laughs> I focused on that. Thank you. If I could just follow up for a moment on that, uh, men in religion. Uh, yeah. Does intersectionality or does your understanding of intersectionality uh, also deal uh, with the intersection of identities, uh, not all of which are independently viewed as sources of disadvantage? Yeah, I think it's a good question. And in, in this in this paper, I had an easy way around it because indeed it was for a special issue on women. So <laughs> I didn't include any cases uh, about men. Like there are some in the case of the European Court of Human Rights. Eh? If you have, uh, you have some case of Sikh men and their turbans uh, in, in particular, also some other men wearing religious uh, dress. Um, I think intersectionality analysis um, can be a way to uncover um, also the fact that some of these markers like male, which generally speaking are markers of privilege in combination with other markers have the opposite effect. Uh, as I said, sometimes, Men, for example, men uh, with a migration background uh, across Europe um, have less access to higher education, uh, have, have, um, have um, yeah, are, are victim targets of, of specific harmful stereotypes, etc. So I think intersectionality reasoning can actually play a role there 
uh, as well in, in, in a way identifying within that privileged category of men, the subgroups that are not so privileged and that do merit special attention of, for the specific ways in which they suffer uh, human rights violations. Yeah, I think I think I think even you can even go further. That's another PhD student of mine who is writing on masculinity as property, uh, a very theoretical gender stuff. Uh, actually, uh, put this on the table. Why is no one? talking about intersections of privilege as intersectionality. Uh, and, and I think, yeah, well, it's obvious why in an adjudication context, you wouldn't do that. It's, it, uh, but it's in a more scholarly context, I think it can actually be, be relevant again as a lens to better understand what's going on. If we understand how privilege reinforces privilege, uh, it's, the other side of understanding how marginalization uh, reinforces uh, marginalization. Thank you. Uh, that brings us to the end of our time. Uh, I want to thank you, Professor Brems, for this extremely challenging uh, and very productive conversation. Uh, the audience uh, for uh, all of their contributions. My apologies to those whose questions uh, weren't reached. Um, there is more to be thought about and more to be done uh, on, this, on this subject. Uh, thank you all very much. Thank you. It was really nice being here. <laughs>